a screwdriver piece. Yeah. Hex. I'm sorry, not Hex Star. Yeah. Hi guys, this is Charles. I'm one of the surgeons at South Paws. Uh, today we're going to repair a tibial fracture in a five and a half month old puppy. Um, very, very similar to the one that I did on Saturday. Um, almost identical fracture. And I've posted the pre-op radiographs on the um, discussion uh, or the co uh, community discussion page. So if you want to refer to that, um, you can see exactly what we are dealing with. So it's making a medial incision to the tibial shaft. Uh, <clears throat> medial, you really have to repair almost every tibial fracture through a medial approach because there's muscle covering the rest of the, <clears throat> the rest of the tibia. So that is the approach of choice. Uh, if you are not already subscribed, please subscribe to our channel. If you know anybody else who might be interested in seeing what you're watching today, you can send them a link. And uh, don't forget to turn on your notifications on your subscription so that when we have new surgeries live streamed, you'll get a little ding on your phone. <clears throat> we have the live chat running, um, and so if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, so, put this on the other end. Can you get the table up a little bit, please? A little bit more. That's great, thank you. All right, let's see if I can adjust the lighting a little bit. Thank you. All right, so that's a little bit better here. Get my Metzenbaum scissors, please. So the plan is right now to do a plate and some cerclage wire around the, um, the fissure in the middle. But that plan may change the, as we go farther along. So I'm right down over the medial malleolus of the distal tibia. And I can see my saphenous vein in the middle here. Can I get quarter turned up to 40, please? Philippines. It's nice for the Philippines. So right down under the tibial shaft here. <clears throat> Can I get some number three gelpies, please? Thank you. So this fracture happened about three days ago, so we're already going to have some remodeling. Probably a nice big plot present here. And there's a little fissure at the bottom uh, of the tibia. If you look at the radiographs on the um, community um, channel. Uh, you can see that fissure down at the bottom. Otherwise, I would have done like a MEPO or minimally invasive plate osteogenesis. Um, but because of that fissure, I have to be a little bit more careful with what's going on down there. I may put in some cerclage wire or a lag screw across that.
council right here. Can you get you to lift up on that for me just a little bit? And that's all clot, you know, early callus sitting right there. It's quite thickened. Gelfies in there distally. And I have to decide if I'm going to sacrifice that saphenous vein in order to improve my exposure. So that's getting into the fracture right there. I think that saphenous is really going to get in my way. I'm going to sacrifice that. And there's so much collateral circulation in the back legs and in the front legs um, that I don't, I don't have any problem doing that. So and in this young pup, there's also going to be quite a bit of um, or quite thickened periosteum, sorry. Now the other issue that we have to contend with here is that we have growth plates top and bottom and so we're going to have to be really careful not to cross the growth plate with any of our appliances. So that's that really thickened periosteum. I don't know if you guys can see that right there, but that is probably a couple of, you know, or a mill thick at least. Rich with progenitor cells. Yeah. So nice big blood clot in the tissues here. So I'm going to see if I can just get a ratchet or reduction forceps. Sometimes you get lucky and it just kind of falls into place here. Just like that. That's pretty close. Um, what I might do is... Have on with two bone clamps, and then we'll just see if we can. can uh, let's see. Can you go with a pointed reduction force up right across that fracture there? Yeah. One more. Yep. So that is pretty much perfect right there. So let's get rid of some of these other clamps. Okay, so I'm pretty happy with our reduction. Right there. Okay, so that fracture is reduced. Um, hello from India. Once I get comfortable, then I'm going to be able to fix this. Um, and I start putting screws in, that's when the bad joke starts, so stay tuned. I know that that's what everybody's actually watching for, the quality humor. Okay, so that's great. Really well reduced. Um, so, I don't even think 
Look, I can put a cyclage wire around there, but I think that since I've got it so well reduced with this, once we get that plate on with our locking screws, I'm just going to hold everything in place really nicely, so I'm not going to bother with cyclage wires. Can I have a look at plates, please? I'll do a 10. I'll start with a 10. Yeah. I've got a 10 hole, three five narrow here. Let's see how that fits. That's gonna be probably all I'm gonna be able to get on here. All right, so can I get a plate benders please? And we'll be feeling for the fibula head to sort of tell where our proximal growth plate is and the malleolus throughout this. Yeah, you can actually see, so I, I've got the whole bone exposed and so I can see that I'm not crossing the growth plate. You know what I mean? Like you can actually see a little bit of a uh, difference in coloration of the periosteum. Can you hold on to the middle please? So I'm just putting a little bit of a bend in the plate. Maybe a little bit too much, we'll see. It's actually pretty good. And the nice thing about using um, locking plates is that you don't have to absolutely contour the plate perfectly to the bone. Just a little bit more. Yeah, I'll just put in a cortical screw at the at the bottom. Just grab a towel clamp and um, hook it through the bottom of the plate there. All right, down there. So I'm just grabbing onto the plate with the towel clamp so that I don't drop it because I have dropped a few plates in my time. It's really frustrating, especially with the old um, regular DCPs where you had to contour it perfectly and then you just have it completely contoured and then you drop the plate. Very annoying. So that's looking pretty good there. I'm just going to put a clamp around immediately if I can. So that's pretty good, but it's tending to slip a little bit. I think I'm just going to let it rest there. Just bring that down a little bit. That's great. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to start driving some screws. Can I have a, you know what, I'm going to do um, my distal screw first, and I'll make that a cortical, so let's use a 2.5. Thank you. So I'm going to use a cortical screw distally so I can bend it away from the growth plate. I felt that go through the fibula. Uh, depth gauge. Critical when you're using a depth gauge is to see what it measures on zero. So we zero it at the end there and then we can see that it's zero right there as well. So that's measuring 24, so I'll take a 28, please. Uh, and I, you know what, I might use a Cancellus, just because it's soft bone and it'll be a, yeah, so that's 35, 28, I believe. 
28 there. So I'm using Cancella screws and you can see that the thread, there's um, quite a bit of depth on the thread. And that's to grab onto the softer bone. With that, so we've got. Uh, next thing I'm going to do is just check to make sure I've got bone underneath all of my holes, which I do. A little bit more space there, but that's all right. All right, so now I'm going to switch to a 2.8 millimeter drill bit um, for my locking screws. Yeah. Uh, so that's definitely a 2.8? Yes. Okay. Um, so with distal or proximal fractures, I tend to use a lot of cross pins, um, uh, particularly if they're in younger dogs. How far away from the joint there? So that's the proximal tibial crest there. So we're miles away from the joint. Very soft bone. It's so young. Uh, 24, so I use a 28 again, please. But this is a locking. That looks big. That really big. Yeah. Yeah, a different scale. Okay, so. Do we have um, do we have a separate? Okay, so we we um, if we could get a screwdriver, oh, the, detachable? the detachable one, so Are that they I can. All in the TPLA kits now? No, I think there's one separate. Yeah, just yeah, just see if there's a separate one. If there isn't, I'm happy to just yeah. Old school. Yeah. Okay. So I've got my distal and my proximal screws in place. And is that scalloped on the bottom? Yeah. So I could just put three screws top and three screws bottom and be done with it. Uh, where's my guide? It's measuring 19, I'll put in a 24. Do you recommend hybrid or circular external fixation in distal proximal fracture, bigger adult patient? Um, this is labeled incorrectly. Would you like to three five? Star, yeah, that's, yeah, that's correct. Uh, so, question about whether I like hybrid or ring fixators. I tend to use, I, I actually am not trained in putting on ring fixators. That would be James or Ricky, my associates. And so, uh, if something needs a ring fixator, I send it to one of those guys. Um, the benefit of a ring fixator is that um, you can put in much smaller wires. And so, Certainly, if I'm struggling for space, if I'm struggling for space um, in the segment, I think a ring fixator is the better way to go. Whereas if I have lots of space, then you can use 
Um, let's go down here and then, then we know the fracture is completely stable. Um, then you can use just a type two external fixator. Benefit of a type two is that the implants are a lot cheaper and they're easier to put in. So, yeah. Yes. Um, all right, so did I measure that already? I did not. I'll use a 24, please. And these, both of these screws are engaging the fibular head. Thank you. And 16, so I'll put in a 20. So because um, this plate is scalloped on the bottom, on the underside, that means that there's no stress riser in empty screw holes. So I'm happy um, to leave screws empty. The old DCPs that we had, um, the... Uh, bottom of the plate was flat, so if you left a screw empty, it was actually a weak point in the plate. Um, and so you couldn't really leave them empty, whereas now you can, you know, you can leave them empty without any problem. And given the age and the size of this dog, this is more than enough plate, more than enough hardware for this patient. Hello, Michigan. Where are you in Michigan? I used to live in Michigan. And my wife used to live in Michigan. But at separate times. 24, please. So I picked up some of the fibula head again on that one. I mean the fibula on that one as well. They can knock down my next one. Okay, well that's pretty much it. Just go back and tighten all my screws. Um, and so we that's still perfectly reduced at our fracture site. We've picked up the fibular head distally, so I don't need to worry about the fissure. Um, so I've got actually four cortices with each of these distal screws. Um, so I reckon that is a very solid repair. So I'll just go back through and tighten my screws again. It's a young dog, so this uh, is going to be a short race to fracture healing. Um, so I bet in six weeks this is already going to be biomechanically stable. So we don't need to worry about fatigue fracture of the plate. And I'm going back and tightening all of these just to make sure that my head is locked into the plate well. So let's go ahead and lavage that. Give me a little bit of flush, please. We'll take some 2 PDS, please. We'll be dripping on the floor here. That's great, thanks. That's plenty. You can't even see that fracture. That's the fracture site right there, guys, and you cannot even see that. So just goes to show you that we did not need the cerclage wires. And we'll just wrap that periosteum back around that bone and it'll be healed very, very quickly. 
Okay, I don't know where the, oh, uh, sorry, Detroit, I know where it is. I used to live in, I think I lived in Detroit when I was really little, when I was about three. I did. So that's, uh, somebody asked me on the last one whether I was going to be a gardener and a carpenter, and I decided to be a carpenter, partly because it was an older dog, whereas this one, <clears throat> I decided to be a gardener because this is going to be healed so quickly and we've got that nice healthy periosteum less concerned about getting absolute anatomic reduction although we managed to accomplish that anyway Uh, can I get some more, can I get some 3 PDS? I'll just tie off these saphenous veins on either side. <clears throat> can I have um, you elevate that step for me, please? Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Number Couple of questions there that I can't read. Can you see those, Jeff? Uh, yeah, we've got one here. Hello, Dr. Charles and team. Nice surgery. Um, sorry, join late. Uh, why only a few screws um, and at ends of plate? Um, so that's a good question, and the reason why I've gone with just a few screws at the ends of the plate is because by allowing a little bit of flex in the fracture, which putting screws at the end of the plate um, will do, what you do is you actually stimulate more callus formation and more fra uh, rapid fracture healing. Um, and so this is kind of relates to the, the carpenter versus the gardener. And so we're just kind of leaving things alone in the middle. Um, we've got a nice, intact, robust periosteum in this dog, and so this is going to heal very quickly. And so that's why we've elected not to uh, fill every single hole. We also have a plate, which is a, a locking plate with scalloped underside, and what that means is that it's, um, it's not weaker uh, in the screw holes, and so um, it's really ideally suited to this kind of situation. The other thing is that if you fill every single hole, you actually con uh, concentrate the stresses around, um, or, or concentrate the stresses more closely together and so the strain or the movement that you get at any one place is, uh, or at one particular place is amplified. Whereas if you just fill in a few screw holes and leave a large gap unfilled, what that does is it distributes the stress and the strain across a larger area. And so you're less likely to, to concentrate at that one spot. In addition to the fact that it's gonna stimulate callus formation by allowing a little bit of movement Across the entire, um, across the entire fracture. That's the way I understand it, anyway. Yeah. So Jeff just said we're going for secondary bone healing rather than primary, and secondary is going to be formation of a blood clot followed by a cartilage uh, scaffold, and then that's going to be replaced by bone, as opposed to primary bone healing, where we have cutting cones that actually jump across the fracture gap and um, uh, cutting cones of osteoclasts that then get replaced directly with new bone by the osteoblasts. 
so primary bone healing has less of a callus and it's more anatomic, but it takes a lot longer to achieve biomechanical stability compared to secondary bone healing, which has a large, larger callus and results in increase in biomechanical stability very quickly. What's the other question up there? Uh, question was, uh, did you use a surplage wire? We did not use a surplage wire because it came together so nicely and, uh, and, and held very nicely and I was able to put the plate in. Sometimes I just use surplage wires just to hold things still while I put the plate on, but this one, because of my point of reduction force, if I was able to bridge that um, spiral fracture really nicely and so by attaching the plate on proximally and distally, it stabilized really nicely and kept that um, uh, the spiral fracture really nicely reduced. So I'm going to let Jeff take over from here. We've got lots of surgery today, and I don't have a surgical resident with me, so I should be able to live stream the majority of them. So thank you very much for watching. Again, if uh, you're not subscribed, please subscribe to our channel. Um, Let's see, so is it correct to have at least a minimum three screws per segment? How about if one segment is too short to accommodate three screws? So, um, good question. Um, so we would like at least four cortices per segment and by having three screws, that means that we would have six cortices. If you cannot have four cortices per segment, then you're gonna run into problems with fracture stability and you probably ought to add something else to the repair either an external fixator or um, an uh, intramedullary pin. And so if you use an intramedullary, intramedullary pin along with a couple of screws and a plate proximally and distally, that's going to provide your rotational stability as well as your bending and, uh, um, and shear uh, uh, stability. So that's another way uh, to manage it. Again, to repeat, if you can't get four cortices in both segments, you can add an intramedullary pin um, or you can add an external fixator to further stabilize it. Um, so there are a couple of questions. What have you done to take care of rotational forces in the bone? So um, surclage wire, look, while it makes the fracture looks re look really nice and neat, it doesn't actually do that much to stabilize rotational forces. Look, it helps with a spiral fracture along a oblique fracture, but really what we're counting on for the stability in the fracture is going to be our plate. And so our plate, and, and especially a locking plate, is going to do a great job of stabilizing our rotational forces. Just to um, review, um, the, the forces that we're trying to stabilize are bending, shear, rotational forces, um, compression forces, and avulsion forces. And so with this fracture, the main forces that we would be concerned about would be um, bending uh, to less extent shear and rotation because it is a spiral fracture um, and there's no avulsion forces um, because there are no muscles that are, you know, or not a lot of muscles that are trying to pull the fracture apart. Um, compression is not going to be a big issue um, because we've got good apposition of our fracture ends and so the big ones are bending, um, uh, really bending uh, is the um, the major force that we're dealing with here. And so uh, a plate, especially a locking plate, is excellent at neutralizing all the forces except possibly avulsion forces. We would be less likely to plate something like a tibial tuberosity fracture or a greater trochanteric fracture, although you can in some situations. In that situation, you'd be more likely to use like a pin and tension band because that converts your avulsion force into a compressive force across the fracture. Um, so uh, we are going to use intradermal sutures. I tend not to use skin sutures if I can avoid them. Uh, intradermals just look nicer. I think they're probably less likely to have, uh, or to some degree have wound healing complications, particularly if you have um, big knots and tight sutures and that kind of thing, whereas intradermal sutures are just nice. They're not irritating, less likely to get chewed, chewed by the patient. So that's what we would recommend. Uh, just reviewing the rest of the questions, making sure that I've answered everything. I think that's about it. Um, so 
If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to post them on the comments after the um, uh, after the video, and I will try to uh, get Jeff to remind me to post the post operator graphs uh, when we get them. So thanks a lot for watching. We should have more um, more surgeries to stream later on today, and. Uh, Jeff is doing uh, the subcutaneous right now. Um, and the comment that it looks awesome, I'm sure he'll appreciate that. Um, and then we are going to add intradermal sutures on top of that as well. Uh, so thanks again. And I will see you again, hopefully in an hour or so.